In this section, we'll explore the debate over what to do with the poor, how the rich in society should react. The wealthy, of course, were aware of the horrible conditions of the industrial poor, and many justified their wealth disparity with uh, social Darwinism. The idea of social Darwinism was initially developed by Herbert Spencer in his 1851 book Social Statics, which was a bestseller in the U.S. in the late 19th century. Spencer, one of the founders of modern sociology, applied the evolutionary concepts of naturalist Charles Darwin which Darwin was then developing, to societal development. Unrestricted competition would weed out the, uh, the weakest, leaving only the uh, strong, and thus a better society. Tough-minded Yale professor William Graham Sumner was much blunter in another bestseller, What Social Classes Owed Each Other, uh, published in 1883. Inexorable natural laws controlled the social order, he said. Quote, a drunkard in the gutter is just where he ought to be. The laws of survival of the fittest were not made by man, and it cannot be abrogated by man. We can only, by interfering with it, produce the survival of the unfittest." Unquote. In other words, some argued that helping the poor per per uh, perpetuated misery and, and you know, was counterproductive. The government uh, owed its citizens nothing but law, order, and basic political rights. To challenge social Darwinist defense of laissez-faire, reformers were not without their own arguments. Uh, in Dynamic Sociology, uh, also published in 1883, Lester Frank Ward, a geologist, argued that contrary to Sumner's claim, the supposed laws of nature could be circumvented by human will. Just as scientists had applied their knowledge to breeding superior livestock, government experts could use the power of the state to regulate big business and protect society's weaker members and prevent the needless exploitation of natural resources. Other social theorists offered more utopian solutions to the problems of poverty and social unrest. Henry George, a self-taught San Francisco newspaper editor and economic theorist, proposed to solve the nation's uneven distribution of wealth through what he called the single tax. In his book Progress and Poverty, published in 1879, he noted that speculators reaped huge profits from the rising price of land that they neither developed nor improved. By taxing this, quote, unearned increment, the government could obtain the funds necessary to ameliorate the misery caused by industrialization. The result would bring the benefits of socialism, a state-controlled economic system that distributed resources according to need, without socialism's great disadvantage, the stifling of individual initiative. George's program was so popular that he lectured around the country and only narrowly missed being elected mayor of New York City uh, in uh, 1886. The vision of a harmonious industrialized society was probably best vividly expressed in the uh, utopian novel Looking Backward, uh, published by Edward Bellamy in uh, 1888. Cast as a glimpse into the future, Bellamy's novel tells of Julian West, who falls asleep in 1888 and awakens in the year 2000 to find a nation without poverty or strife. In this future world of 2000, West learns, a completely centralized state-run economy and a new religion of solidarity have combined to create a society in which everyone works for the common welfare. Bellamy's vision of a conflict-free society where all share equally in industrialization's benefits so inspired middle-class Americans fearful of corporate power and working class violence that nearly 500 local Bellamite organizations called nationalist clubs sprang up to try to turn his dream into reality. Ward, George, and, and Bellamy, you know, they didn't deny the benefits of the existing industrial order. They simply sought to rein it in or humanize it. These utopian reformers envisioned a harmonious society whose members all work together. Marxist socialists advanced a, a different view. Elaborated by German philosopher and radical agitator Karl Marx, who uh, lived uh, from 1818 to 1883 and published Dust Capital in 1867, uh, one of his books, uh, probably his best known book, uh, he advocated Marxism, uh, which rested on the uh, labor theory of value, a proposition which Adam Smith uh, also had accepted that the labor required to produce a commodity was the only true measure of that commodity's value. Any profit made by the capitalist employer was surplus value, 
appropriated from the exploited workers. As competition among capitalists increased, Marx predicted, wages would decline to starvation levels and more and more capitalists would be driven out of business. Society would be divided between a shrinking bourgeoisie, capitalists, merchants, and middle class professionals and the like, and an impoverished proletariat, the workers. The proletariat workers would then revolt and seize control of the state and the, econo and the economy. Although Marx viewed class struggle as uh, the essence of modern history, his eyes were also fixed on the shining vision of a communist millennium that the revolution would eventually usher in. A classless utopia in which the state would quote, wither away and all exploitation would cease. To lead the working class in a showdown with capitalism, Marx and his collaborator Friedrich Engels helped found socialist parties in Europe, whose strength grew steadily beginning in the 1870s. Despite Marx's keen interest in the uh, United States, Marx's views had little appeal to late 19th century America other than for a tiny group of primarily German-born immigrants. The Marxist-oriented Socialist Labor Party, founded in 1877, had only 1,500 members by 1890. Part of the uh, reason that Marx's views never took over uh, was that the Industrial Revolution's economic boom gave most Americans enough hope to avoid such radical solutions. Enough had property that they feared to lose. Certainly, as well, not all industrialists were as cold-hearted as uh, the social Darwinists. Some justified their laissez-faire with the so-called Gospel of Wealth. The name of an article that Andrew Carnegie published in 1889, the Gospel of Wealth justified laissez-faire by saying the wealthy had a moral obligation to give some of their wealth back to society. It was a religious and moral obligation, but not a government one. Carnegie, as noted earlier, became a major philanthropist. Carnegie wasn't alone. John D. Rockefeller contributed greatly to public health and public sanitation, including new schools of public health at Johns Hopkins University and Harvard University. Rockefeller, who helped found uh, the famous Rockefeller Center in New York City, also created the University, uh, also helped create the University of Chicago, one of uh, the nation's leading schools. Likewise, the uh, railroad magnate Cornelius Vanderbilt uh, contributed a lot of money and created Vanderbilt University, another leading national university. In any event, uh, whether we're talking social Darwinism or Marxism or you know gospel of wealth, all of these theories were over uh, were part of the debate over what to do of the given the wealth discrepancy that the Industrial Revolution perpetuated. This concludes uh, this section on the debate over uh, what to do with the poor and the wealth discrepancy.